Hi everybody, it's Peter Schiff. This is Friday, uh, November 20th. Well, another week comes to a close. Uh, gold again is very strong on the session. Despite the fact that stocks were in the red all day, we didn't finish with big losses, but gold was up six bucks. In fact, gold has acted uh, very strong uh, over the last several days, even despite the fact that we've seen a sell-off in equities. Again, I think this shows me that gold is still in the process of decoupling uh, from other assets and rising despite the fact that assets like stocks are falling. Now, on that note, you know, Mira Rubini was out talking about asset bubbles again, and he thinks that, you know, we're seeing bubbles in gold and other commodities. And he acknowledges that maybe uh, these prices will continue to rise, but that it's surely a function of a speculative mania of a bubble, and that according to Rubini, none of these movements in commodity prices or gold reflect the fundamentals. And I have to uh, respectfully disagree with uh, Rubini uh, because the fundamentals do support higher gold prices and higher commodity prices. What he doesn't understand is a big part of the fundamentals is all the money printing. The government is changing uh, the, the fundamentals by printing money. Governments all around the world are creating money. And so that changes the demand. Commodities, and gold in particular, have to rise in price when governments are creating so much money, when interest rates are so low. That's not speculation. That's not a bubble. That's simply the market reacting to the debasement of paper money. You can't just print a bunch of money and expect it to have no effect on commodity prices. And you can't say that all that printing of money doesn't affect the fundamentals. It is a fundamental fact of life that we're creating a lot of inflation. If we could simply print money when the economy was weak, and it, that printing money would have no effect on prices, then governments can always just print money. But you can't do that. You can't just create purchasing power with a printing press. And if you do print money, the money is going to lose value and prices are going to rise. And just because prices are rising doesn't mean it's a bubble, doesn't mean it's a mania. It simply reflects the loss of purchasing power of money. And that's what's happening with commodities and in particular gold. And I think though gold is not just reflecting how much purchasing power currencies, and in particular the dollar, is losing now, but how much more purchasing power they're likely to lose based on the policies that we are, in fact, pursuing. You know, talking about uh, debasing our money, I happened to watch on CNBC the other day uh, test the interview or the testimony of Geithner, a Treasury of uh, a Secretary Geithner, uh, before Congress. And there was one heated exchange where there was a Republican congressman that was basically calling for the Treasury Secretary to resign. Of course, I think he was, should resign too, but there, it's not like they're going to replace him with anybody better. But it was interesting what Geithner said. Uh, first of all, he became very defensive. And one of the things he said was that he said that all measures of confidence in the financial system are up since he's taken office. Oh, really? I beg to differ. Look at the price of gold making new highs. What is that? That's a vote of confidence in our financial system? The fact that gold is approaching $1,200 an ounce? That's a vote of no confidence. That's a huge vote of no confidence. What about that the fact that the dollar is hitting new lows of the year? It's the lowest it's been since he took office. How is that a vote of confidence in our financial system? If anything, it's a vote of a lack of confidence. It's a vote of no confidence, the fact that our currency is falling. If there really was confidence in what Geithner was doing in our financial system, the dollar would be rising and gold would be falling. So for him to say all measures of confidence uh, are up, obviously that's completely disingenuous. Then I think what was even worse is at the end of this exchange, basically Geithner tried to lay the blame for the economic problems on either the Republicans or Congress because he said in, in, in a very sharp tone that, well, I'm simply dealing with the terrible situation that I inherited from you. You, obviously, you know, being addressed to this particular congressman. Now, I don't know by you if he meant Republicans, because this guy happened to be a Republican, or Congress in general. But, but who does Geithner think he is? He was the president of the New York Federal Reserve Bank from 2003 to 2009, which meant he was also a voting member of the FOMC. He was... He was at the Fed. He was a key player. He was um, Alan Greenspan's partner in crime. He voted for all the rate cuts. 
He voted to bring interest rates down to 1%. He voted to keep them there for years. He voted to raise them slowly. He was there blowing up the bubble with Alan Greenspan. The Fed is more culpable for our economic mess than Congress. They're both culpable, don't get me wrong, but I think the Fed is even more to blame than Congress. And Geithner was a key player in the Fed that inflated the bubble. For him to sit there and try to pretend that he inherited this situation from the Congress, who is he kidding? He created the situation. Anyway, also, you know, looking at you know, the crazy things that governments are doing, I happen to notice a statistic now that says that 96% of the new mortgages now being issued in this country are either being guaranteed by Freddie and Fannie or the FHA. Unbelievable that these eight entities are now even more entrenched in the mortgage market than they were before. They are single-handedly artificially propping up the entire housing market, and we're setting ourselves up for a much bigger disaster. I don't know if anybody saw this article in the New York Times. I linked it on the website, europac.net, but it was about three kids up in San Francisco. And I say kids, you know, you see that I'm getting old. They were, you know, 25, 27 years old. But they pooled their money together, and they put a 3.5% down payment and got a near million dollar mortgage guaranteed by the FHA. And they were in shock. They couldn't believe that they were able to borrow all this money with a government guarantee. We have learned absolutely nothing uh, from the mistakes of the past. We're simply repeating them on a, on a grander scale. Also, you know, in closing, I happen to notice again an exchange also on CNBC about the audit the Fed bill. Uh, by, uh, you know, sponsored by Congressman Ron Paul and now has a lot of uh, co-signers. Um, but in arguing against it, the position is, well, we don't want to compromise the independence of the Fed. And the people who don't want the Fed to be audited are claiming that they want an independent Fed. Well, the Fed's independence was compromised a long time ago. I mean, this is just, this is just lip service. I mean, if the Fed was independent, we wouldn't have to audit it. The problem is it's not independent. It is doing Congress's bidding. They're acting as an arm of government. They're an engine of inflation. They're helping to reelect incumbent politicians. They're monetizing government deficit spending, government stimulus plans. And it's because they've already surrendered all the pretense of independence. That's why I'm in favor of auditing them. Believe me, I would like to see the Fed independent. Uh, and unfortunately, they're not. They've highly, highly politicized. And it's, it's completely ironic that the people who are arguing against the audit are claiming it's because they're for Fed independence when they're the ones that are leaning on the Fed so heavily to keep interest rates low, uh, to keep the stimulus going, to keep uh, uh, funding the financial system. It's completely uh, unbelievable. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope everybody has a great, has a great weekend. Uh, I'll be back again next week. Take care.